Yeah, tonight I'm going to continue the discussion of um, different aspects of what LASP uh, does. I'm, um, I sort of like to look forward, uh, not backward, and uh, Tom Sparn here reminded me of the quote from uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, who said to John Adams, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. But I think it is um, often worthwhile to look back, look over what has gone on and um, maybe better position oneself for the, the future, whatever that may hold. Um, so the early years of LASP, a number of people in the room uh, know this history pretty well. Some may not know it so well. But um, the, uh, in 1947, uh, sort of what we're commem commemorating with this um, anniversary year, the University of Colorado Physics Department began uh, research um, and uh, working with the Na Naval Research Lab, the U.S. Air Force, and um, using uh, sounding rockets, the V-2 rockets, um, and uh, in order to carry out uh, research related to uh, the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere. And uh, so the lab was named the Upper Air Lab UAL. In uh, 1951, the UAL developed uh, solar ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet instruments and uh, led the development of uh, rocket pointing controls for the uh, captured V-2 rockets and for the Air High uh, rockets, again working with NRL and the Air Force Geophysics Lab. Um, in 1954, another uh, watershed uh, time when uh, several um, UIL uh, personnel spun off to form what was Ball Brothers Research Corporation, what's today Ball Aerospace. In 1957, there were some uh, remarkable events. Um, in, to the surprise of many in the world, uh, on the 4th of October 1957, the Soviet Union uh, launched the first artificial Earth satellite, Sputnik 1. This was little more than a um, transmitter, a beacon, but it uh, put the Soviet Union squarely in the, um, in the driver's seat as far as uh, space um, activity and space leadership. Uh, just a little over a month later, a much more sophisticated spacecraft was launched, Sputnik 2. This uh, is a little bit of a fuzzy picture, but you can see that the main passenger on this was the dog Laika. That was uh, the first uh, mammal, I guess, into space. And um, this also contained a very sophisticated uh, instrumentation, especially energetic particle detectors from the group of Sergei Vernov at the uh, uh, Moscow State University. Now, the Soviets um, launched this that didn't have a tape recorder. The apogee of the spacecraft was over Australia. The um, Australians recorded the data and asked for the code to interpret the data. The Soviets refused. The Soviets demanded the data, the Australians refused, and so there was a, uh, quite a standoff, and um, the Vernoff belts faded into history, and, uh, and it was left to this group of distinguished people to uh, make the first great discovery of the space age. This is uh, Bill Pickering, who was the director of the Jet Propulsion Lab at the time. This is famous rocketeer, Werner von Braun. And this is my uh, former mentor, uh, James Van Allen. Together they developed the Explorer 1 spacecraft, the uh, engineering model being held aloft here. And uh, this, along with Explorer 3, uh, determined quite clearly that the Earth is enshrouded in very high energy particle radiation zones. And uh, this was, of course, a, a marvelous uh, discovery, uh, the first discovery, as I say, of the space age. I think one can, in many ways, really trace the, uh, the origin of the, the concept of space physics back to this uh, sort of seminal moment. Uh, going back to this uh, history then, uh, in 1958 as well, uh, Dwight Eisenhower formed NASA as an agency on October 1st, 1958. And uh, the Upper Air Lab and NRL uh, continued uh, partnership, making measurements of solar, UV, and uh, extreme ultraviolet also making first uh, solar x-ray images. And, uh, and so the uh, lab be really began the solar terrestrial and planetary research with NASA funding at that uh, time. And then uh, early in the 60s, 
uh, I think it was under Bill Rents that the uh, ULA, UAL uh, became the uh, LASP, the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. And in the mid-1960s, about 65, uh, Charles Barth, my predecessor, came here and really brought uh, a passionate interest in uh, satellites and uh, interplanetary missions and, uh, and planetary exploration. So the lab today, of course, is uh, uh, pushing the frontiers in several key scientific areas uh, in planetary studies, in solar influences, uh, atmospheric sciences, and space physics. The latter is what I'm going to spend much of my time talking about uh, tonight. Um, and uh, these numbers may be a little outdated, but LASP has, um, for a university lab, has had an extraordinary number of uh, programs and successful projects, deep space missions, earth orbiting missions, uh, almost countless uh, suborbital rocket experiments, balloons, and of course, um, one doesn't measure success only <coughs> by, by space missions, one also um, must uh, recognize that a balanced laboratory carries out vigorous theoretical investigations, modeling, and underpinning all of this is a tremendous engineering, project management, and operations kind of capability. I don't know how well people can see that, maybe from the back of the room it's uh, rather hard to see, but this is trying in one chart to put on all the programs, all the flight programs that have been uh, carried out or are being carried out now over time. And uh, along this axis uh, are the uh, objects of study, the sun, the planets, and beyond, former planets such as Pluto. Um, and uh, along this is the time axis, going back into the uh, 1960s. And uh, I'm going to come back to this uh, chart again and again uh, with broad groupings of, uh, of what I think are key areas of investigation. First I'd like to just point to are the um, solar kind of solar related kind of observations, a selection of those. And uh, I do that because the sun is really the fundamental driver of, uh, of our system, certainly uh, from the standpoint of space weather it is key. So understanding solar variability, understanding the nature of the solar driver is a, a key thing. In NASA, uh, solar and space physics is termed heliophysics, a made up word. Uh, but uh, understanding the sun, um, understanding the nuclear furnace at the center, um, and uh, recognizing that photons created in the, near the center of the sun uh, may take 100,000 years or so to get out to the edge of the radiative zone. The outer part of the sun um, having um, a large turnover, the convection zone, um, having the differential rotation uh, where the uh, equatorial um, sun uh, rotates faster than the polar sun, leads to a dynamo kind of action, leads to generation of strong magnetic fields in this region, and uh, really is the source of a lot of the uh, activity that we recognize uh, on the sun. The surface that we see, the photosphere, is a roiling, a boiling uh, surface. Um, the uh, upwelling and downwelling of the gases there S powerful sunspot groups with strong emergent uh, magnetic field. Many of these sunspot groups are much larger than the Earth in uh, their dimension. As from these regions that emanate uh, many uh, fascinating uh, disturbances, the chromosphere, and then of course moving out into the outer layer of the sun, the, uh, uh, the corona itself and large prominences, spectacular emissions, and these are not simulations but are real uh, data from uh, present day spacecraft. And then the magnetic fields that these kinds of currents flowing give rise to. And throughout this talk we're going to be talking about the kind of powerful bursts of energy that come from the active sun that uh, carry with them uh, energetic particles, strong magnetic fields, and these um, can be the drivers of uh, powerful disturbance in an Earth vicinity. And these uh, active knotted regions can give rise to powerful um, X-ray flares and strong energetic particle acceleration as seen here. And uh, all of this really uh, spells um, the power of uh, our companion in space. Now, uh, last in space, uh, we talked about the rockets that were geared toward looking at the sun, understanding aspects of the sun. 
the uh, early uh, orbiting solar observatories uh, were um, some of the first uh, investigations in space that the, the lab undertook uh, of this nature, having UV spectrometers on board. The, uh, in this case, the OSO-8 at Hughes Aircraft, human for scale, and I suppose one of the spectrometers that's being examined here, according to caption, would probably have been a LASP uh, spectrometer. Another mission that is really key, um, looking at the sun and looking at the sun's influence on the uh, Earth's uh, uh, atmosphere, middle atmosphere in particular, was the solar mesosphere explorer. I point to this as an example of several key things. One of, of LASP's ability to put together uh, sort of all aspects of the observatory part of this, Ball providing the spacecraft bus. But this was also the time in the 1970s, I guess, 80s, when, when it really became clear that um, there was immense power in doing operations here in the university, and um, also to involve students strongly in that operational aspect. And so it uh, pursued both atmospheric and uh, solar objectives, but with a strong programmatic content. And again, another mission that has been extraordinary in its success and um, similarness in the, the solar radiation and climate experiment source that continues to operate today, but with the instruments built here at LASP and the spacecraft bus built at Orbital Sciences. Um, but again, the um, ability to um, in a more or less PI mode to be able to um, lead such investigations to direct them towards key problems of both scientific and uh, more programmatic, more operational uh, interest, in this case being able to measure the total um, irradiance of the sun as a backdrop for climate studies has been crucial. And again, it's probably hard to see from where you are, but this is showing uh, the um, total irradiance measurements daily basis from the beginning to uh, 2000, into 2013. Um, so getting more into the things that people th traditionally equate with um, solar and space physics, the space physics part, um, the sun as the driver. So now what about the, uh, the earth as the recipient of those driving forces? Um, Textbooks show this uh, cartoon kind of uh, figure of the uh, Earth and its region of magnetic influence, the magnetosphere. Um, it's a very uh, placid and smooth and laminar, and uh, it's uh, very misleading as a consequence. Uh, what we find when we really observe the system is it's uh, very little like this. You can recognize the features, but it's much more uh, active and dynamic than one would ever guess from these kind of uh, figures. And so going back to our diagram here, there have been several missions uh, that folks here in the lab over the last uh, couple of decades have been involved in and are now involved in that have played, I think, a key role in understanding the particles and fields aspects of this uh, object just a few hundred miles above our heads, the magnetosphere. One that I uh, like to focus on is uh, SAMPEX. This started when I was at uh, NASA Goddard, uh, as Tom was mentioning. Um, the, uh, it was the first of the small explorer missions of NASA. It was called the Solar Anomalous Magnetospheric Particle Explorer, SAMPEX. Uh, this uh, small spacecraft um, was uh, launched into a polar, um, low Earth orbit, polar orbit. And uh, the, gear, the goal was to measure the Van Allen belts, the radiation uh, regions surrounding the Earth, and sort of monitor those and put them in the context of other um, energetic particle populations. Um, and I'll show figures like this, like this one up here, say, um, at times throughout this talk. And so I just want you to recognize that what we call L here is really just measuring where magnetic field lines in the Earth's dipolar field cross the equatorial plane. So one is near the Earth's surface and out at six and a half or so is where, say, communication satellites tend to reside. And what's portrayed here then in color coding, say uh, from dark blue to bright red, is maybe five orders of magnitude of uh, particle intensity for multi-MeV particles. We see from the SAMPEX measurements beginning in the middle of 92 onward, we see clearly the inner Van Allen zone, the slot region between the two belts. This is what Van Allen and company uh, really discovered. And then this outer zone. 
And it's nothing like the quiet, uh, constant kind of uh, thing that models might suggest, but it's varying all over the place on essentially all time scales. And there are particularly powerful events that can occur when the sun is particularly active, as in the late October of 2003, the so-called Halloween storms, where the radiation belts are completely uh, reconfigured, completely changed in their character, and we've published results like that. But a SAMPEX uh, would have been a success if it operated for a year or so. Um, it continued to operate for over 20 years. And uh, uh, LASP here became sort of the center of data analysis for SAMPEX uh, during the latter part of its career. And um, it was really uh, only the increasing solar activity in 2010, 11, 12 that really caused the demise of the spacecraft due to atmospheric drag. And it uh, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere on the uh, 13th of November of 2012 after um, over 20 years of uh, service. Uh, it was the best monitor we had, but as I'll tell you a little later, uh, it was replaced uh, just before its demise. It was replaced by the radiation belt um, monitoring uh, spacecraft, the radiation belt storm probes, uh, which were later renamed the Van Allen uh, probes. Another mission, uh, Bill Peterson here and uh, other colleagues in the room, uh, worked on the NASA uh, Polar mission. Uh, I was the project scientist for a while when I was at uh, Goddard. And uh, the combination of an ability to look at the Earth and look at the aurora in particular with uh, polar and to make in situ measurements at high altitudes of the energetic particles and plasmas was a key component of that. And especially to be able to use, um, in my view, to use polar together with other spacecraft like SAMPEX was a, a marvelous um, success of the mid-1990s onward. Another mission that uh, uh, I think uh, is an extraordinary uh, turning point for LASP in, in many ways was the SNOWY mission, the Student Nitric Oxide Explorer. Um, this was a, uh, a small, inexpensive uh, mission, primarily done by students with professional uh, oversight. Uh, began in about 95, launched in 98. Again, would have been considered a success if it had operated a few weeks, probably. But instead operated for uh, nearly six years and had uh, dozens and dozens of students who participated in many different aspects of the mission. And this was a, a mission uh, geared toward uh, looking at uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation but again, the reason that I really uh, point to it in, with respect to particles and fields is that working with Charles Barth, we did many papers where we compared the energetic particle measurements from spacecraft like SAMPEX with the resulting effects on middle atmospheric uh, odd nitrogen content in the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, this bringing together of the, the photon world and the um, chemistry world with the particle world I think is crucially important. Another mission that was led out of the University of California, Berkeley, but had a strong and continues to have strong uh, last scientific involvement was the five spacecraft uh, Themis mission. Um, this was uh, a mission uh, geared toward putting the five spacecraft in carefully designed orbits in order to study the much more global behavior of the Earth's magnetosphere, this magnetospheric environment, and to address some of the thorniest problems in space uh, physics, understanding what are the processes that lead to, from a highly stressed, magnetically stressed configuration of the magnetosphere to a much more relaxed configuration that leads to powerful auroral enhancements and so forth. And uh, this was the uh, fundamental goal of the Themis uh, mission. So again, I point out that the, the um, cartoons portray the magnetosphere as this very uh, smooth laminar kind of body. But uh, the, in reality, the fields that emanate from the Earth um, at their outer reaches are constantly undulating, are driven <clears throat> very strongly by the uh, constant buffeting of the solar wind. And the surfaces, the boundaries, are undergoing um, modulations on all time and space scales, essentially. The structure, of course, is to have a, a separation boundary called a magnetopause, a standing shock wave out in front. The solar wind, a supersonic, superalphanic wind, interacts with this um, object and produces 
many of the kind of dynamical features that we ultimately see within the magnetosphere and on the Earth's surface. Uh, enhancements of the coldest plasmas called the plasmasphere. Also enhancements of medium energy uh, ions, the so-called extraterrestrial ring current and the Van Allen radiation belts are all commingled in the inner part of the system and are all one way or another driven by this interaction between the solar wind and the Earth's magnetosphere. There can be direct entry of particles, there can be heating and storage in the more distant night side called a plasma sheet. Um, and fundamentally, all these processes are driven by the process of interconnection between the solar wind magnetic field and the Earth's magnetic field. When they're of opposite polarity, then this day side gate opens, energy can pour in from the solar wind, can really pump up the Earth's magnetosphere, can lead to powerful enhancements particles streaming uh, into the uh, polar regions forming the aurora as we talked about before also enhancing these other particle populations deep inside and ultimately leading to a, a much more um, e exaggerated kind of uh, system than uh, and its ground state. The most uh, powerful manifestation of this visibly at least is the aurora and as seen from space or from the ground these are immensely complex, and, uh, but are driven essentially by uh, energetic particles. The radiation belt storm probes are studying exactly these kinds of things, and the magnetospheric multiscale coming up is going to be geared toward examining in exquisite detail the process of magnetic reconnection. This is a universal process, important uh, in almost every um, uh, system we see on all scales of how do you convert magnetic energy into other forms of uh, uh, energized particles, heated plasmas. And uh, we need to understand how these sy complex systems can catastrophically reconfigure themselves, how turbulence relates to global scale behavior, um, how in particular our magnetosphere extracts energy from the solar wind and imparts it into the magnetosphere and, uh, and drives the auroras. And, uh, so many of us are involved in the MMS, Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission. And LASP is going to be doing the science operations for this entire program. This has now uh, become a flagship mission for heliophysics, about a billion dollar mission. And uh, all the science is going to flow through LASP here, so it's going to be a very exciting time over the next years. Uh, this brings us to the more applied side of the discipline. Uh, I've alluded to space weather many times. But this active sun uh, with coronal mass ejections uh, blasting out from the sun at perhaps uh, two, three thousand, even 3,500 kilometers a second, multi-millions of miles an hour, interacting with the magnetosphere can produce a profound effects on human technology. Coronal mass ejections can cause uh, such things as uh, power outages and other things uh, as uh, has been well documented the fundamental issue here is that the um, solar wind interacting with the uh, Earth's magnetosphere leading to these powerful currents flowing uh, in the upper ionosphere can uh, couple into pipelines, into electric power grids, can cause uh, the effects such as the power outage, famous uh, power outage in 1989 in Hydro-Quebec. But uh, there are many, many other kinds of effects of uh, space weather. Uh, disturbances to the ionosphere, we still rely as a society on, uh, on high frequency uh, reflections from the ionosphere uh, for uh, airlines and others. Space communication through the ionosphere, the effects on uh, communication, on GPS, global positioning system. It's astonishing how dependent our society is on GPS and the timing signals related there too effects on precision agriculture, navigation at sea. Uh, all these things depend on GPS. And of course, uh, the active sun, the energetic particles from the sun can affect um, satellites, can cause uh, problems with the electronics on board, can cause degradation of the solar panels, and can even be threatening to uh, uh, astronauts on the space station and would certainly be a great threat as one moves beyond the protective envelope of the Earth's magnetosphere. So space weather is a big deal 
And uh, I'm delighted to say that the Boulder community <coughs> and uh, LASP are uh, big, big players in this uh, aspect of um, space physics. Um, I'm going to highlight, uh, we've talked about MMS already, but it's, it's going to play an important role, as I think you can infer from what I said before. Uh, two missions in particular are the first in the series of NASA programs called Living with a Star programs, LWS. The Solar Dynamics Observatory has been a key one here for LASP. Uh, this spacecraft um, can, has a uh, very sophisticated investigation from LASP called EVE. Um, Tom Woods leading that and uh, looking at the, uh, again, the extreme ultraviolet and ultraviolet emissions from the sun. Probably most famous, uh, SDO has been providing spectacular images uh, across multiple wavelengths of the sun and its corona. And uh, these images tell us a great deal about prominences, about active regions. And by using those observations in exquisite detail of the sun, together with the observations at the earthward end, we really now can study the connected Sun-Earth system in an unprecedented way. And so um, the Living with a Star program, after initiating with SDO, moved on to the radiation belt storm probes that I've alluded to a bit before. This is a two spacecraft uh, mission was the concept. It had the, um, the goal of after more than five decades to go back and really understand the Van Allen belts uh, in uh, scientific detail to understand what leads to the acceleration and loss of particles in the belts and to understand uh, perhaps to the point of um, forecasting ability the, uh, the way these belts change over time and space. And uh, last um, proposed for and uh, won the uh, opportunity to build what I think is one of the core instruments on the whole mission. That is to measure the 1 million electron volt to 20 million electron volt electrons and the um, roughly 10 to 200 MeV protons from the sun, solar energetic particles, and to do that in a much better way than has done before. So these are the Husky uh, is instruments that resulted using the latest in silicon, passivated silicon solid state detector technology for the <coughs> basic telescope. Um, using uh, massive amounts of tungsten and uh, aluminum to shield the sides so that one got very clean measurements. And uh, I like to say these are the baby pictures <coughs> of the instruments, uh, the two flight units for the two spacecraft, uh, A and B, and uh, our engineering model, which we still have available for testing. Um, again, just to brag a little bit about um, last performance, um, the engineering team, led primarily by Vaughn Hoxie, uh, did a magnificent job. We were the first to deliver, first to install, first to turn on the instruments, and the first to um, get scientific results, which I'll talk about in a second. But let me just play for you the the launch sequence here. So the spacecraft was launched on a uh, United Launch Alliance ULA uh, rocket on the 30th of uh, August 2012. This was 4 a.m. so this really lit up the night sky in uh, Florida. And uh, the two spacecraft were together on the spacecraft on the on the launch vehicle and got a, a very good ride into space. Um, they plan was to put them into a geostationary transfer orbit, roughly speaking, uh, near the Earth uh, at um, perigee and then out um, to a high altitude at apogee. And the uh, two spacecraft were uh, kicked off slightly separate and uh, put into this elliptical orbit. Their goal was to um, examine, as I say, the nature of the Van Allen belts, but to measure all the properties with unprecedented accuracy and uh, precision. The, uh, as this schematic indicates, here's the inner belt, the slot region, the outer belt this is what we expected to see. The instruments from uh, LASP were supposed to be turned on about 35 or 40 days after launch. Uh, we uh, urged and we succeeded in getting them turned on uh, two days after, uh, two and a half days after launch. And um, we were delighted that we did. So I'm going to show you some more figures in this of this ilk, and so to help you understand this a little more clearly. Again, turn your head on the side. Here's the Earth. There's North America, South America. Uh, so the 
the coordinate system here is one where one is near the Earth's surface, six is out at the outer edge of the outer Van Allen belt, and uh, that's plotted along in time, so you'll see a lot of plots like this. So uh, when we launched and turned on so early, um, a couple days after the launch itself, we were right in the midst of a powerful radiation belt enhancement event. Once again, the scale here is a color scale from low intensity to high intensity. This is now, you know, with 25% energy resolution or something, this is a 4 to 5 MeV electrons being portrayed in the color code. Um, we saw just what we expected at first, the inner zone, the slot region, the outer belt. But then, um, just a few days after launch, there emerged or there was a remnant or something of, of a, a belt that would just stayed there and stayed there for the better part of a month. And uh, there was an outer Van Allen belt, there was a middle Van Allen belt, and there was an inner Van Allen belt, and that's not the way the textbook said it should be. Um, so we, uh, in order to look at this in a little more dynamic way, I'm going to show you an animation now where we're laying down each orbit. We're putting out about three days worth of orbits on a meridional plane, taking away orbits, adding orbits. And what you'll see as this moves across is the inner zone, the slot region, this feature, and then the outer belt uh, varying all over the place from low to high intensities as this uh, ring feature just stays there and stays there. Then about the end of September, the whole thing is cut off just like a knife edge, and then uh, it goes along at a very low level, and then there's an immensely powerful new event that occurs. And so this whole thing uh, really suggested, as I say here, immodestly writing, rewriting the science textbooks about how the Van Allen belts work, but it really shows that it's possible for highly relativistic electrons, super relativistic electrons, to, uh, to stay around for extraordinarily long periods of time, essentially immune from the external forcing of the solar wind. And uh, this was uh, published in Science, and this particular version was published in the AGU EOS uh, issue. But uh, a more of a schematic diagram of this then is that we might have expected to see the inner uh, Van Allen belt in green here, the more purplish outer belt, but there's this third belt that comes and goes, and we've been studying this now intensively, and uh, have uh, sprinkled uh, theoretical holy water on a lot of this in, in uh, Nature, uh, Science, and other journals. But uh, I emphasize again that this is a, uh, an applied program in the sense that we're really trying to understand the connected Sun-Earth system. So we have SDO, say, in early October, mid, uh, like 5, 6 uh, October, seeing the Sun, seeing the uh, powerful active region, seeing a powerful coronal mass ejection, that came out, hit the Earth, and produced this uh, extraordinary acceleration of particles that you see here. So this is another version of this. So this is 2 MeV, say roughly 4 MeV, roughly 6 MeV, million electron volt electrons. I show this because I just think the data are beautiful. Um, the patterns that are here are beautiful. But um, I also show that um, we were very fortunate indeed that we turned on our instruments when we did, when we saw these things, the strongest events of the mission so far, during a time when we might otherwise have been off. But I also point to uh, the, the punctuated nature of things, where you, you have a powerful interaction with the solar wind, with the sun, and then there are long periods of gradualism and things just sort of decaying away. Again, Von Hoxie and, uh, and I were talking about, well, we ought to really portray this in a more geographic sense. So we produce this kind of picture. So now we're looking down on top of the Earth. We're laying out each orbit <coughs> in a geographically fixed uh, coordinate system. So the orbits walk around the Earth during this month and a half, complete the circle. And we've likened this to the kind of spirograph toys that we play with as kids and the uh, orbits are laid down here and show clearly the inner Van Allen zone, the slot region, and the outer belt um, in all of its uh, um, azimuthal glory here. Um, to complement the, the work that's gone on with the Van Allen probes, uh, my colleague Shinlin Lee um, and others uh, and the Aerospace Engineering Department offered a course in building small satellites, so-called CubeSat, and this was uh, dubbed the Colorado Student Space Weather Experiment, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, 
amazingly enough, it launched just about two weeks after the Van Allen probes were launched. Um, it would have been a success if it operated at all in space. It operated beautifully. It continues to operate uh, now here a, a year and a half or more later and is providing wonderful contextual um, and uh, correlative measurements for the Van Allen probes. So these <coughs> spacecraft, the RBSP or Van Allen probes, working with low altitude satellites of the sort we've been talking about, with the Themis, with other uh, spacecraft in the constellation, uh, also working with operational satellites such as the GO satellites from uh, NOAA and uh, Air Force assets and so on, really constitute now what one might very uh, realistically call the Geospace Observatory fleet. When combined with the solar observing platforms, we really have an unprecedented ability to study the entire uh, near Earth system, to understand the acceleration processes, and to develop the kind of predictive forecasting tools that we need to understand the space weather problem. And uh, uh, I think this has turned out to be an extraordinary opportunity. People often uh, have asked, uh, wh why is space weather such a big deal? Why, does, why are we so worried about it? And um, I have had the privilege of leading for the National Research Council for the National Academies, a study that was published back in 2009 that uh, looked at the economic and societal impacts of severe space weather. This report has, I think, gained a fair amount of traction. And uh, in it, we talked about what would be the effects if there was a really severe event of the sort that some of you may know about that occurred in 1859 called the Carrington event. And uh, it's interesting that in July of 2012, the sun performed quite a, an interesting active experiment. This is uh, data now from the Stereo A spacecraft, which is, in a moment I'll show you is quite a, far away from the Earth around in, uh, in its orbit. But here's the central uh, image of the sun in ultraviolet. You see this blast material. This is a powerful corona mass ejection coming more or less straight at the Stereo A spacecraft. The snow is uh, very, very intense energetic particles that come from this event. Um, this, is, this corona mass ejection from the sun out to the uh, Earth's orbit, 1AU, uh, took 19 hours, which uh, means that it was moving at an average speed of about 2,500 kilometers a second or so out from the sun. Um, and uh, we've uh, working with the Wang Shi, the RG Enlil model, another thing that's a, a big uh, item here in, with NOAA for space weather forecasting. Um, work with uh, Dushan Adrasil and others. Uh, what we see is that the Stereo A spacecraft on this date, the 23rd, was at this location. The Earth is here. All the other assets we care about, Mercury, Venus, most other NASA spacecraft were safely in the other quadrant. And so only stereo was out there in the, in the line of sight. But it was uh, perfectly targeted at stereo A. And uh, it uh, lets us to do a thought experiment. What if the Earth had been at this location? Or what if this had occurred a week earlier? <clears throat> and so we've used models that uh, are running here at LASP to take the magnetic field observations from stereo, to take the measured solar wind speed, and to really feed that through the models and to look at what the power of the um, magnetic storm would be that occurred if that would have occurred if that had struck the Earth. And what we find and what was reported in a published paper in the Space Weather Journal was that this storm would have reached in, this, in terms of this DST index about minus 1,200 nanotesla. The largest storm uh, recorded in the DST record in the 20th century was uh, 589 in these units. So this storm would have been easily two or three times larger than any um, geomagnetic storm that uh, has been seen in modern technological times. And uh, again, I would contend that if this storm had occurred a week earlier, we'd probably still be picking up the pieces, uh, so to speak, from this uh, event. Now our society um, has tremendous interdependencies, but one of the cornerstone technologies is really the, the electric power grid. And uh, storms of the sort we were describing here uh, would have devastating effects, uh, is believed, on the power grid. 
knocking out electric power, as one knows from such things as Superstorm Sandy or other events like that. If you lose electric power, you quickly lose the ability to pump oil and gas, to have communication, potable water, emergency services, transportation, everything suffers. And so space weather is a big deal. And Boulder is the world's center for uh, dealing with space weather issues. And uh, again, I'm delighted that LASP and, and our expertise is being brought to bear to the, on these key scientific uh, problems. So uh, coming uh, toward the end of my remarks here, let me just say that uh, the things we study about the Sun-Earth system have a great deal of applicability to other systems. Uh, planetary studies, uh, we learn from other planets and we apply lessons from Earth to these other planetary systems as well. One that I'm delighted we're involved in here at LASP uh, is the MESSENGER. I, don't, I never remember what the acronym is, but it is an acronym. Uh, but it's a mission that's in orbit, has been in orbit since March of 2011 around the planet Mercury. And what we've found um, with our studies, in this science paper we did with uh, Thomas Zerbuchen in 2011, um, is that the solar wind interaction with Mercury's miniature magnetosphere has many analogies with the Earth case, also has many fascinating differences. But being able to measure the plasma's energetic particles and magnetic fields in the Earth's case um, uh, and to uh, understand their relationship to, in many ways, the stronger forcing of the solar wind at the Mercury orbit um, has proven to be a fascinating comparative planetary studies kind of uh, um, problem. Another that's coming up, and again, many people in the room are very involved in this, the Mars uh, Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution MAVEN mission. This was launched uh, very successfully in, uh, in uh, November of 2013 led by Bruce Joukowsky, and uh, this is, has a, as its key goal to understand the solar wind planetary interactions, to understand the evolution and loss of the Martian atmosphere over time, make inferences about historical changes in the system, interpreting the water loss from the planet and so on, and this is um, a PI project led here from last, but with Berkeley, Goddard, uh, Lockheed Martin, and many other uh, partners. So um, let me launch this and just say that last space investigations have run the, the gamut. I often point out that other than the planets not being the right relative size and not, usually not lined up this well um, <laughs> and not this close together, this is a perfect picture of the solar system. Uh, but we study the sun, the inner planets, the missions at the Earth, the uh, moon, I uh, have an uh, investigation at uh, the moon now, LADI, the LDEX, Mars mission, as I talked about. Have, of course, had highly successful observations from Galileo, Voyager, Juno on its way to, to Jupiter, uh, Voyager and Cassini uh, still operating at Saturn, the Voyagers having flown by Neptune and Uranus, and um, the, in 2015, the flyby of New Horizons, Pluto, uh, the former planet Pluto. Um, and so LASP has sent instruments to every planet in the solar system beyond, and this is a claim that no other organization in the world can make, and I think it's something to be very proud of. Looking a little bit uh, further into the future, particles and fields continue to be uh, a big component of what the lab will pursue. I've talked about continuing um, Van Allen probes and magnetospheric multiscale. A solar Probe Plus will uh, launch with uh, Bob uh, Ergen and others involved in this uh, mission uh, that will launch in 2018. We'll make deep dives into the Earth, uh, into the sun's um, outer atmosphere, and uh, hopefully not in deep into the sun itself, but uh, we'll make multiple passes through understanding much more about the origins of the solar wind <coughs> and its evolution. And finally, I'd just like to remark that our solar uh, observing from space is going to be strongly complemented by the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope, or now called the Daniel K. Inouye uh, Solar Telescope, and our uh, friends and colleagues from the National Solar Observatory will be moving here into this building into town over the next uh, two, three years. And I think it's going to be an extraordinary time for uh, science when we can do um, exquisite ground-based and exquisite space-based observations of the solar driver and look at the consequences at Earth. 
So let me summarize by saying that I think uh, LASP uh, traces its origins clearly back over the 65 years to the upper air laboratory of uh, CU Boulder back in those uh, early days. The space physics observations of the Sun and Earth's space environment have been central to LASP and its predecessor from the very beginning. These wide-ranging modern measurements of plasmas, energetic particles, and fields in space really place LASP at the forefront of international space physics research. There are few places in the world that uh, do as many things, uh, in my opinion. And the application of this scientific knowledge and the technical prowess to these space weather issues also places the lab in the first ranks of societal relevance in this uh, modern technological society, and I think that's also crucially important. So with that, I'll say thank you and be happy to answer any questions that I can. Thank you. I think I see hands back there, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Is that Tom? Yeah. Hey, Tom. Um, in the L diagram, you're showing the banding, the sort of vertical banding. Is that a sampling effect? Or is that yeah, we're actually over plotting the two spacecraft, and when you start to look on a, uh, you know, broad, uh, on a uh, narrow enough time uh, scale, then you're seeing the orbits actually laid down in time. So uh, when you, um, when you really scrunch it together, they merge all together. But uh, that's a really an advantage to, for us, of course, when the two separated spatially and temporally. We can really start to examine the space-time uh, aspects uh, beautifully with the two spacecraft. But that's a, a sampling kind of effect, right? Is there another question? Yes? The uh, spacecraft that got in the way of the coronal mass ejection suffered uh, not permanent, but it was certainly stressed. In fact, um, the uh, energetic particles were uh, the highest they'd seen. The, um, the memories were uh, really being zapped. The, uh, the beacon that was supposed to return um, the sort of alert, you know, telling what was happening in real time was um, so stressed that uh, they are still trying to uh, piece together what the actual um, nature of the densities and so on of, of this, uh, this blob of plasma really were because it, it exceeded all sort of expectations for uh, solar uh, forcing kind of events. Um, but uh, fortunately the spacecraft wasn't, wasn't killed by, by the bullet. <laughs> it was only wounded. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and back and then I'll come um, to the point. So you mentioned CubeSats. Yes. Mm. As, as yeah. yeah. Well, um, CubeSats, um, for a while now, I think, have, in so, at least some agencies, have been sort of curiosities uh, for the National Science Foundation, for example. I think they were thought of as interesting educational activities, uh, a good way to train students, but that they perhaps were not going to return uh, particularly uh, important uh, science. I think other agencies like the Air Force and uh, the National Reconnaissance Office and others have recognized that if you can miniaturize the right instruments, you can really make CubeSats immensely powerful, you know, uh, individual stations. And by uh, aggregating many of these in the right way, you can really start to do, in some ways, more than you could do with one Battlestar Galactica that's fully instrumented in the, in the full-up way. And so I think there's a rapidly evolving vision for CubeSats going from this curiosity or this education and training role to being much more central to many kind of scientific um, activities. It's still, I think, a challenge to get enough aperture on, on some of these uh, really small spacecraft, but uh, a step up from a three unit, that is, each, each cube is a 10 centimeter cube, as you probably know, and uh, the one from Colorado, uh, Chin Lin's, was a uh, uh, 3U, so there was, it was 30 centimeters long. Um, if one goes to 6U or 12U kind of units, one can start to do immensely powerful things with those. And, uh, and then uh, if you imagine that they're inexpensive enough so you can replicate that a lot of times and put them in many locations, you really start to uh, get somewhere. 
Now you point out a, a key problem is how do you keep track of all those things? How do you get the data down? And then how do you uh, how do you utilize the data? That's a tremendous data assimilation problem. It's a, a tremendous analysis problem. Uh, but that's I think where our society is headed generally is dealing with larger and larger, more complex um, data sets. And uh, that's uh, I think a good challenge for us to have is to figure out ways to do more with that um, and to uh, extract full measure from the data. And um, I, I hope that will be one of the thrusts in, in this lab uh, in the near future. So you have no current project on the horizon in the next five year horizon? For the big data? Well, to exploit any of that. Well, I, uh, in fact, we're working with uh, Wallops uh, folks, NASA folks, uh, to um, actually try to um, improve the basic components of CubeSats and to make that a much more accessible thing. So we are, uh, we have another um, CubeSat that I think is in, at least in the selectable range, uh, Minx, right? Who, is anybody here? Uh, and yeah, okay, there he is. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but but uh, we're we're uh, we're in there pitching, huh? What is selectable? Mean? It means it's uh, was found to be a category, uh, you know, excellent category one kind of a thing. It's just uh, whether NASA has enough money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're working on it. Yeah. But we can talk more afterwards too. Are there other questions? Yes. Oh, just to follow up on your comment right there about if NASA has enough money. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of any thoughts about the future of this where you know we're doing things one or two a decade rather than mm. you know many satellites and many missions and when something big like ATST comes along it more or less causes the shutdown of other things or we have well, I don't know if ATST has shut down too many. Uh, James well, Webb has, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but no, you're right. I mean. Um, I wish something. I don't know whether you found any of the things in this exciting. I personally do, and uh, and I wish that um, I could have a group of congressmen who who would get similarly excited to the excitement that some of us feel. I, <laughs> if if you have the uh, if you have their numbers, please uh, and uh, and have have your checkbook. Let's get together. Um, um, I'd say that uh, it, to me it's uh, profoundly disappointing that uh, I believe that in a 17 and a half or 18 billion dollar agency if we put more of our uh, emphasis on these kinds of things we could be doing marvelous marvelous things and uh, we're spending money in inefficient and ineffective ways in many uh, many um, disciplines. I, w I won't, uh, I'm not going on, I, am I on the record Tom? Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, again, I, th I think you know that uh, that it is disappointing that we that we can't have a more regular cadence of uh, of these uh, fairly modest sized kind of programs. Yes. So, can you put LASP in context with some of the other agencies that we hear about all the time? Um, I mean, who else is doing something like this? Who are the other? Uh, other university groups? So you mean, or, or yeah, okay, Folks. okay. Well, um, I would say that LASP is. Um, is one of the uh, most capable um, university kind of research labs doing um, solar space physics uh, and planetary kind of science. I'd say we're comparable in many ways to the space science lab at, at Berkeley, probably similar in size or so. Um, unfortunately, there are fewer and fewer universities that have the kind of capabilities that we're talking about here. Of course, there are the NASA centers, which are certainly a step up from uh, uh, Goddard Space Flight, for example, of Goddard Space Flight Center is much larger. Uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, much uh, broader uh, in scope uh, probably than, than we, uh, much larger. The Applied Physics Lab of Johns Hopkins also uh, larger. But, uh, but uh, as far as strictly university research labs, LASP is, uh, is uh, one of the eminent ones for sure. And uh, I hope it will stay that way <laughs> or improve its posture. So. Any other questions? Yes. So I was wondering when you're showing the simulations of the information you get from the solar wind mm. Uh, mm. with the uh, Earth's field. Right. So when the Earth's field changes, which it has, uh, have you run these simulations for cases like that? And what, yeah. I mean, what, um, what when, the dip when the dipole weakens, you get more of a quadrupole dominated kind of field. And when the solar wind interacts with that, 
you get kind of spectacular results. You get auroral bands in many different locations and uh, completely different than when the dipole dominates. And so people have really uh, modeled the kind of a weaker, uh, you know, weaker field cases uh, uh, where the, uh, the dipole has reversed and during those times. And so that's the nice thing about computers. You don't have to wait for nature to produce it. You can, you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that's why I, I'm a big believer in using models to help us um, understand and to test hypotheses and then uh, see what so the... one might have seen uh, when, for instance, the Earth's magnetic field flipped. Right. Flipped is a... Yeah, yeah. Uh, one might have seen in, the, uh, in rocks or whatever uh, special... Uh, additional tracks and so on. Yeah, um, and p people have speculated about whether um, this would have led to, you know, kind of harsher conditions or different conditions in different parts of the earth. And I mean, this is a, this is a big question and d it would depend a lot on what epoch you were looking at, what life was like at that time, if it even existed. Um, and, uh, and how that would impact um, the atmosphere and hence the entire system. But I think it's, uh, to me, it's pretty clear that the uh, driving of the system by the solar wind, and especially if you don't have this strong protective magnetic field, that's one of the arguments in the Mars case, and one of the things that's going to be explored with MAVEN, of course, is if you go to a system that doesn't have the strong magnetic field, then the solar wind can impinge much more directly. It can, uh, can erode away a lot more of the atmospheric constituents. And so, uh, this is another important argument for comparative planetology to looking at systems in different states of development and being able to compare and contrast those. But it's a really good question. Tom. Following up on that, comment on exoplanet studies? What do you think is relevant Yeah, of course, uh, Bill has been operating Kepler for, what, four years? Yeah, and will we hope continue to operate in, in yet a different mode? And of course, the I, I think a key discovery of Kepler has been the just the sheer prevalence of planets, and um, the, the nature of those planets seems to exceed the range that we have in our own solar system. But there are Jupiter-like planets, there are hot Jupiters, there are, are um, uh, more uh, near-Earth kind of uh, analogs being found. And I think the things we're, we're learning here about what controls the processes, what might be some of the signatures. For example, uh, I think it would be an interesting thing to, and I think people are looking for this, but you know, if you had a Jupiter-like planet with a very, very powerful magnetic field and very strong trapped radiation, then low frequency radio observations of that might be able to reveal pretty directly that you've got a, a magnetized planet around this. And it's a very subtle thing, and observations have to probably improve to do that. But it's something that should be added to the to the um, tools and the arrows in the quiver, you know, to to observe remote systems. Um, looking in the radio might be challenging, but it's probably easier than trying to see the planet directly. So, yes. The CME event in 2012 is that of the same magnitude as the current? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking of that and the Chemlyansk meteorite as two sort of near misses recently. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, and I'm wondering, in regards to your comments with the funding, has, has, have those events generated any more serious interest in uh, the importance of monitoring these things and maybe being able to respond? To yes, they have. And um, sometimes it's fringe policymakers and sometimes it's core policymakers, but I think it, it probably has uh, done so. And. Um, yeah, I, I should have said uh, more that uh, recent work from a um, uh, Chinese group and Berkeley group have followed up on our paper and have looked more carefully at what the conditions were uh, in the, in the um, intervening solar wind for the July 2012 event. And in many ways it was analogous to the Carrington event in that it wasn't a single CME, it was uh, actually a, a dual, a double whammy. And what seemed to happen was that a smaller CME went out and sort of cleared out the inner solar system, and then the big one came, and it could propagate very freely, and it was almost, almost unimpeded. And so um, this, uh, the event in July 2012 was in fact, um, what I was trying to allude to there was that the storm that occurred, would have occurred on the Earth had it been there, 
would have um, been much larger probably than the Carrington event. So it was more powerful. It moved, it moved as fast. The magnetic field was stronger, uh, we infer, and the uh, storm that would have resulted was stronger. And it seems to have been this special, the perfect storm kind of scenario. And so those are, yeah, Michael. Seems like these uh, perfect storms, they may not happen very often, but I always right. worry about the idea of sending uh, astronauts or man to Mars or being on the surface of Mars. And it never is, is talked about, but it's a serious. Yeah. Yep, so that's right. Concern and that's right. Yeah, and uh, we don't know when these are going to occur. Um, we are in the we are in the throes, if you want to call it that, of a very modest solar maximum in terms of sunspot number. Uh, we were in 2012, and uh, and yet the sun seemed perfectly capable of producing an extraordinarily powerful coronal mass ejection. And so, if you were betting and you were you know betting the astronauts' lives on sending them at the right time. <clears throat> um, I, I would rather not be the one responsible for, for signing the, the agreement because I think it would really be very hard for us to guess right now um, whether such an event could occur. And if it did, it certainly would be a life-threatening event. Um, there have been cases in the past, where, uh, you know, who is it? somebody said luck is not a strategy, you know, and uh, it's, not, it's not a strategic plan. And um, um, in the... Uh, in the Apollo days, the, there was a very powerful solar storm in August of 1972. And um, Apollo 16 occurred a couple months earlier. Apollo 17 occurred in December of that year. Um, and it's generally recognized that if, if uh, those Apollo astronauts had been out on the surface of the moon in August of 72, they would all certainly have been killed by the radiation dose associated with that. So Lee Sullivan's the no administrator. She was the first yeah. woman to walk in space. She happened to walk the spacewalk is of a delay in the in the uh, South Atlantic anomaly, not where you would ne yeah. normally do yeah, it. Yeah. There's a delay in the mission. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that was a dangerous area too. Yeah, yeah. Astronomers rediscover the South Atlantic anomaly for every new mission, don't they, Dennis? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think the strategic plan, the plan for the astronauts, if, they, if there was a powerful storm on the moon, was that the more senior, they would dig a hole, the more senior person would get in the hole, and the more junior person would lie on top, so they would absorb all the radiation dose. And, and uh, it seems to me we have, a, have to have a better plan for astronaut survival than that. So, so uh, Tom, I've probably exceeded my authority here, so should we call it a night? Okay. Okay, thanks.